Whenever a piano player comes to a piano, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to play a bunch of notes all clustered together like that. We've been using a term in this course in a rather vague way to describe those note clusters. We've used the term chord. Now, what I'm playing there is a series of chords, a series of harmonies. They are something that capture a kind of overall sound framework that I'd like to be able to break up into smaller component parts. And to do that, I'm going to do something that's a little bit odd. You might think that I'm interested in chords as being built out of each and every one of these single notes, which is true, but the first thing I'm actually going to do is to try to think about these structures by only playing one of them and exploring the mysteries of just the single pitch by itself. Specifically, what I'm going to be talking about is the overtone series, because the development of the idea of the overtone series, especially beginning early in the 18th century, came to provide a foundation for how we understand chord structures, the idea of harmonization itself. And for that reason, we will need to revisit some of the discussion that we had before about acoustics and psychoacoustics, where we talked about vibrations and frequencies coming from essentially the vibration of a complete string moving as a unit. What we need to start thinking about is how those strings might move in component parts. And we're going to do that for a particular reason. This notion of the overtone series of a single string is going to provide us with a kind of thread to link together many other notes in a way that we can understand a relationship between them that will simplify seemingly complex musical textures like this. And what we're going to want to do in particular is refine the idea of the chord to a specific type called the triad. And to do that, what I will begin by doing is opening up the piano a little bit more, moving the microphone a little bit closer so that you can hear some odd effects that pianos can have when you combine two different notes. What I'm going to do is end up playing one note and specifically not playing another and then hearing if there's some kind of relationship that nonetheless obtains between them. What I will discover will provide the basis for these new structures that we're going to be introduced to called triads and out of that we'll begin to build a theory of so musicians have long been aware of a kind of hidden potential sound quality in individual pitches that they heard if they were played by different kinds of instruments. And it was finally early in the 18th century that a French mathematician and acoustician named Joseph Sauveur came up with a mathematical account of this phenomenon. We call it the overtone series or the harmonic series and I can demonstrate it in the following way. To start out with, any time I press a key on a piano like this, what's happening is two things at once. When I depress the key, there's a damper inside that keeps the key from, uh, sorry, that keeps the string from vibrating. So if I play this particular pitch, it's not reverberating through the other ones because the dampers are resting on all those other strings. If I press something like the damper pedal, what I'm doing is raising those dampers, and then you'll hear the effect of this pitch echoing through the others. So the sound quality changes because it isn't just one string that's in vibration, but many others besides. So one thing I can do then is narrow things down, and I can select particular pitches to vibrate either sympathetically or not with the energy that's coming out of that string. So for example, if I were to, rather than play that note, just depress the key itself, that raises the damper without me sending a hammer toward the string. So that means that this set of strings, uh, at this place in the piano, there's probably about two strings that are available to vibrate. If I play something down below, we'll hear something quite interesting. So I hadn't literally played that key, but nonetheless, there was something in the energy and the way it was transmitted from that lower pitch that set that set of strings into vibration. 
So you might think that it's just a matter of energy alone. So if I do this, again, it's available to vibrate. I apply some energy and I get a nice result. Well, why don't I try one of the keys that's right next door to that and see if I can get a similar result. So go to the B, just the semitone below. It's even closer to the pitch that I played, this low C. So it ought to sound just as clearly. Didn't get that at all. What if I went a semitone higher than the C? hearing that at all either but if I just go right in between the two and have a C above that low C that's quite clear to my ear I could choose another example how about this G I'm hoping that's coming through okay on the microphone I can hear that reasonably clearly I'll play without actually sending the hammer toward it a middle C, two octaves above the lower C that I'm playing. So if C4 is depressed and ready to roll, I'm going to play C2. I'm hoping the microphone is picking up. I can keep going in a certain direction. isn't in the greatest tuning right now, so the effect is damped a little bit. But what we're hearing is sympathetic vibration. And what's happening is these other keys have strings of certain length and tension associated with them that are associated in turn with partial modes of vibration of the pitch I've actually been playing. So in a sense, what these are doing is amplifying an effect that's in this string by itself. So many musicians with very acute ears for years before this have been able to hear what sounded like other pitches coloring these sound qualities. And they often thought that these kinds of hidden or implicit pitches were ones that could help us to distinguish between types of voices and instruments. So a reason why a clarinet middle C might sound different from a piano middle C could be from this array of partial modes of vibration or overtones that would color that sound quality. So we use the term timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E, to describe that. Also, of course, there are things like the attack of the sound. How a clarinet begins to produce a pitch is going to sound differently from how a pianist begins to produce a pitch. But what we have is the possibility for a whole series of kind of enclosed pitches within just one that's coming off of one string or chord that give it a kind of character that can distinguish it from that being produced by any other instrument. So what that means is that there's a way in which we can not only describe distinctions in timbre between different instruments, but we could also start to describe how those pitches are related to each other themselves. Because to me, that sounds like a pretty nice harmony in and of itself. Now, I should say that when we talk about partial modes of vibration, uh, the lowest pitch we can call the fundamental and things that are coming up above that we can refer to as the overtones. If we talk about partials, the, the lowest pitch we actually call the first partial, which might sound a bit odd, but that would be first partial, second partial, third partial, fourth, fifth, sixth, and there are partials that extend upward from there. What will determine our capacity to detect them is their amplitude, how much energy they actually have. And so one thing that you start to learn about these kinds of series, it's known as a harmonic series, is that for different instruments or voices, there are different presences for these partials. So sometimes you can have an instrument, for example, that by its nature really tends to emphasize alternate partials rather than the full spectrum of them. Other ones will 
uh, emphasize other sequences of partials in different ways. So they can have different forms of representation and sound, but what we want to start doing is looking at the implication that they carry for unifying a bunch of sounds. In particular, there was a composer named Jean-Philippe Rameau, who was of the same generation as Joseph Silver, and when Rameau came across Silver's ideas, he instantly realized that there was a way in which he could start to describe multiple sounds in relation to each other. That is to say that we could imagine one pitch as somehow generating the other ones. So for example, if I take something like that collection of notes, I have six partials that I'm emphasizing, but I actually only have three pitch classes. I have C, I have G, and I have E. In that sense, I have what we could call a triad of pitch classes. And that's where Rameau took his first steps. He thought that perhaps there's some way that this structure could be collapsed into a nice small theoretical space called the triad. And out of that, he could start to develop a theory of harmony. So the first thing that we want to do is look at this idea of the triad and see how we might come up with a name for different types of triads. What's going to be odd about this is that the only triad that Rameau could actually generate out of an overtone series, and of course limiting it to just the first six partials, was something called a major triad. But there are three other basic types of triad, so we'll go to the board now and take a look at what those triads looked like and how they came to be named. So I've just introduced the term triad, but I haven't been very precise about what a triad is constituted by. I've said that it has three pitch classes, but there has to be a particular relationship between those three pitch classes that will fit into the story of harmony that we're interested in in this episode. I'll give you a counter example. I can build sonorities, call them chords, out of triads that are made up of pitch classes that can be arranged in terms of stacked fifths. So for example, I could take something like a D, an A, and an E. There's a lovely triad of a sort. I could come up with a, another triad, lower down, F, C, G, also a series of perfect fifths. Put them together, and this is the kind of chord progression I could build out of that. just played is not something that I made up. That's the opening to the slow movement of Bartok's second piano concerto. It's actually not played by the piano though. I'm just doing what the orchestra plays. So there is an example of a composer working with triads of a sort to come up with something that sounds very different from what we hear in something like the opening to the Paco Bell Canon. So to come back to the point that I was making earlier, we are thinking about the triad in relation to the overtone series, specifically the first six partials. And so just to summarize what comes out of the first six partials, if I built it on a fundamental of uh, low C, this is what we would have. So that's the fundamental, the overtones, or first partial, second partial, third partial, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And as we saw, these actually have only three pitch classes, but not just that. If I arrange them in the most densely packed space that I can, understanding these pitch classes to be, in some sense, generated by that fundamental, this is what they look like. So when I talk about triad in a conventional sense, what I mean is not just three pitch classes, but three pitch classes that can be arranged in such a way that they can create a chord structure that appears to be in stacked thirds. Now, this idea of stacking thirds will not be restricted 
to the triad alone. We'll be able to extend that to things like tetrads and so forth, and we'll do that later on. But the first thing I want us to recognize is that this is supposed to be a kind of compacted version of that. I'm going to come back to this idea in the next segment because that is going to play a very crucial role in our understanding of how to work with triads in a Ramoian sense. So first of all, I'll get rid of this. And now what I want to do is look at what I have in front of myself. Now, based on the study that we've done of contrapuntal analysis, in particular relative distance, there are several pieces of information that I can get here. To start out with, if I were imagining this to have emerged as a kind of result of three uh, contrapuntal melodies interacting with each other, so at that point, this is what they form, I would want to keep track of all the available interval relationships that obtain between them. And I'd see that there is a major third here, that there is a minor third there, and a perfect fifth there. So that's to say that if I had three parts, then between the lowest and the highest parts, there's a perfect fifth. Between the lowest and the middle part, there's a major third. And between the middle part and the uppermost part, there is a minor third. So there are three pieces of interval information that I can get out of that if I analyze it for relative distance. Now, if I wanted to change around some of these features, I could do something like the following. I could say, well, what happens, for example, if I invert this relationship? What if, instead of a major third underneath, I had a minor third? So, well, if that's the case, and I still want to have the idea of stacked thirds, then I end up with the major third on top, and I'm still preserving that perfect fifth relationship. So one thing that's interesting is that I'm using different types of thirds, but as I do so, I'm preserving the same type of fifth. What happened if instead of having different types of thirds, I stacked up the same type of third, what would the result be to the fifth interval? So over here, what I'll do is come up with two minor thirds. And I'm being very particular about how I notate these things so that they actually appear as thirds. And the result of that, of course, is a diminished fifth. And if I stack up the same type of third over here as major thirds, the result will be an augmented fifth. So if I were to play these triads one after the other. I'll start with this one and go to that, and then I'll start with this and go to that. So note that I'm retaining the same bottom note throughout all of these things. What I'm changing are the interval relationships just above that. Now, there is a way in which I get a sense of the triad as a whole. It has an overall sound quality, which is the product of all of these intervals that it contains. However, we've come up with a naming system for these things that privileges one interval over the others. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is that remember that the idea of the triad is that somehow the upper pitches are understood as being generated by the bottom pitch. It's as though the bottom pitch forms a kind of root that the tree of the triad grows out of. And so in every case, what we'll do is privilege one of the interval relationships to characterize the sound of the triad as a whole. But specifically, that interval relationship will always be coming out of that lowest note. So if I consider what I started out with, this, this triad that came directly from an overtone series, I 
could, for example, look at the relationship between the lowest note and the highest note and say there's a perfect fifth there. And over here, if I looked at the next thing that I did when I jumbled up the thirds, I can see that I still have a perfect fifth. So the idea of a perfect triad wouldn't help me to distinguish between these two things. What I'm interested in, therefore, is something that will distinguish between them. So in this case, of course, I had the major third on the bottom. In this case, the minor third. So the convention has been to describe this triad as a whole in terms of just this one interval relationship called, therefore, a major triad. And likewise, over here, although I have three intervals making up the sonority of that triad as a whole, the interval that's being highlighted because of its relationship to the lowest note, which distinguishes it from this major triad, I'm going to call the minor triad. All right? Now, given the fact that I've already used these comparisons to distinguish between these sonorities, major and minor, what that means is that I can't reuse that interval to draw comparisons with these other triads. And what's helpful about these ones is precisely the change in the quality of fifth. When I had two minor thirds being stacked up from the bottom, I ended up with a diminished fifth, so I could characterize that triad as a whole as diminished, and this one as augmented because of the augmented fifth that's produced by stacking major thirds on top of each other. So if I played from left to right, augmented triad, major triad, minor triad, diminished triad. Okay, of all of these, the only one that Rameau could actually generate out of the overtone series, in some sense, was this one. The rest of these you will not find in any particular sequence of overtones or partials. So this is one reason why when Rameau was first putting his theories out, he wanted to present himself as being a kind of scientist of harmony, uh, a Newton of music, if you will. And he faced a lot of resistance because a lot of people said, look, in terms of what you're basing this on, uh, you can only really give an account of the major triad. However, we really like this idea that you have of understanding these things as though they were generated from a lowest pitch. And so there's a way in which whatever Rameau's original intentions happened to be, the result of that was a way of codifying sounds of triads, these basic chord types that became very popular very quickly. Now, what we need to look at next is what comes out of this, because of course, I've just left these triads in this simple form where I see stacked thirds, okay? What happens if I mix the notes up? Because we might remember, for example, that uh, I had this idea of harmonic inversion that I was introduced to uh, toward the middle of episode eight. And now I'm starting to think that some of the things that I saw there, for example, like this, where I would invert an interval in that fashion. So the orientation of the two pitches with respect to each other has changed. This was very different from simply expanding the distance between the constituents of the intervals while retaining their orientation relative to each other. Major third, major tenth, or compound major third, those sound fundamentally the same. When I actually do this kind of inversion, meaning changing the relative orientation of the constituents of the interval, I had very different sound qualities, going from a major third to a minor sixth. 
So what I need to do next is see what happens when I take not just two notes, but three and start mixing them up in that fashion. And what we're gonna discover is something that's quite odd in a way. The naming system that we have come up with here, which makes sense in terms of one particular interval in relation to the triad as it is positioned with that note in the lowest part, that quality is something that a theorist like Rameau is going to want to insist remains, even if those intervals aren't literally in place like that anymore. So this is going to be a theory of harmonic inversion. It comes from Rameau, and the first thing that I'm going to do is wipe the board clean so that I can take a look at the overtone series once more to remind ourselves what Rameau was talking about and how this claim was developed. I've just drawn out the overtone series for the first six partials. What I've also added in is a little bit more information in terms of frequency ratio. Yes, we are seeing the return of Pythagorean and extended Pythagorean ratios, something that would correspond to a just tuning. Uh, on a piano, for that reason, the overtone series will tend to be a little bit more present in sympathetic vibration when I work with things like uh, the pitch class relationship because that's where the tuning is purest and so the effect of the, the amplification of the partials in the, the fundamental will be the clearest and the most distinct. But that's the basic idea, just as a reminder that this represents the string moving as a whole, and these other uh, pitches are what would be produced if you could imagine it in this way, as though the string were divided in half around a note and was wiggling away, and each half was producing this pitch that's an octave higher, a justly tuned perfect octave higher, something like this that would correspond to ratio between the third of the string and the string as a whole and so on. So these are getting into areas of uh, physics that get quite complex. Some of you might have studied Fourier transforms, but the idea is that a string typically will not behave just as a full complete unit by itself. It has submodes of vibration, partial modes of vibration, and therefore these are the kinds of pitches that we can kind of amplify through uh, the means that we use, for example, uh, a couple of segments ago, where I was depressing one key that would correspond to a partial mode of vibration of that fundamental. And if I left that string uh, on the piano available to vibrate, what it was doing was picking up on the partial mode of vibration that was producing that pitch, and likewise for all the rest of these. I won't play those for you again because I think you could hear them clearly enough in the uh, video segment that I made before. Now I'm putting that information back up because this is crucial to the next part of the story. Here is a triad that can be derived from this overtone series. And of course, I'm just using C for convenience sake. I could use any pitch or pitch class that I wanted to to generate such a series. And again, this is just the first six partials, not all of them, but this is what Rameau wanted to focus on because what Rameau was saying is that this tells us why music ends up having these kinds of structures. In a sense, this is what nature wants us to work with. It's implicit in the fundamental physics of matter in motion. So here I have a kind of collapsed, small-scale version of that overtone series. And the next part is maybe going to be a little bit surprising. What, Rameau wants to suggest is that if I start doing this thing that I learned about in episode eight, harmonic inversion, where I was changing around the relationship of pitches, constituent of intervals in relation to each other. So in this case, as we know, I've got a major third, a minor third, a perfect fifth, and that's gonna be the case as long as that C is in the bottom. Well, if I switch that above the other two components, I get something else. So my original sounded like this, and that first bit of harmonic inversion 
sounds like that. And then I've repeated the process again. Now E is in the bottom, it's below the other two pitches. What if I let that one tunnel upstairs for yet another inversion? And of course, if I repeated the process one more time, I'd end up back where I started. So, a couple of things. First of all, there is a way in which I can understand each of these sonorities in their own terms. For example, I'm just going to take this middle inversion of that and point out that what I hear is a minor sixth and a minor third. Now keep in mind the reason why this thing was described as a major triad was because of the relationship between the bottom note, which stands in for a kind of fundamental, if you will, the relationship between the bottom note and what's in the middle of this thing, this, this third that's there. So as a whole, I was saying, okay, I'm picking out just one of the contrapuntal intervals and saying that's going to stand for the sound of the sonority as a whole, because that's a major triad. Here, I actually have not a single major interval anywhere. And yet, what Rameau wants us to believe is that we will still hear this as a so-called major triad. And likewise, this over here, although at least here, we have the reappearance of a major third. And we also have a major sixth. So in this case, remember, I had a major third and a minor third, a bit of mixed information and a perfect fifth. Nevertheless, we were calling it major. Here I've got more major information. I have a major sixth and a major third. Here I have none at all. And yet I'm supposed to hear this as, in some sense, major in quality. And so what Rameau was arguing was that even if I have changed the relationship between the elements of the triad through inversion, nonetheless, I hear this not just literally as given, but implicitly in terms of this. If I look at this position, I'm now using little letters to represent a series of functional relationships in the triad. I've used this term in passing before, root, the idea of something that the triad is rooted in, that's generating the other pitches of the chord. If I assign that idea, that role, to this lowest pitch there, then that would mean that the third on top of it is literally the third of that triad, and this is literally the fifth. That seems dead obvious, but here's the odd thing. On Rameau's account, even when things are jumbled around as they are through inversion, I'm still going to hear this as the root of that triad, that as the fifth, and that as the third, consistent with this opening position. So the opening position is what came to be known as root position, and this as an inversion, specifically the first inversion. Over here, because I've had another jumbling of these elements, granted in a very specific, limited way in this case, and we'll be expanding on that notion in a moment, I now have what could be called a second inversion. And once again, I'm making that claim based on the fact
that I am supposed to be hearing this in the following way, that this is still the root, this is still the third, this is still the fifth. So that I never hear these harmonic events by themselves as given in purely empirical terms. There's something rationally going on in my mind, subconsciously, however, that tells me that what I am hearing is a changed version of this thing that is in root position, okay? So that's why there is this persistence of these roles, of these relationships throughout all the inversions of a triad. Now, to simplify things a little bit, this is a lot of language to be writing down for analysis of harmonic structures. What we can do is say, okay, I can look at these sorts of idealized representations of these triads and come up with a simple numerical way to describe that relationship between them that I understand in terms of root position, first inversion, second inversion. Up to this point, we've been being very explicit about interval size, uh, not just giving ourselves the diatonic intervals, but saying, well, what kind of diatonic interval? Is it a major third, a minor third, a perfect fifth, an augmented fifth? We've forced ourselves to be very particular. Well, we're going to drop that insistence on particular qualifications of diatonic intervals. We're going to go right back to just what I see in front of my eyes. I look at this and I see a fifth and I see a third. I'm just looking at diatonic intervals unqualified in relation to whatever note is in the bottom. Here I see a sixth and a third. Here I see a sixth and a fourth and here of course I'm back to where I started out. So there's a way in which I could say this is a C major triad in, call it a 5-3 position, that will stand for root position. Here, a C major triad in a 6-3 position, that will represent first inversion. And here, a C major triad in the 6-4 position, which will represent second inversion. So now what I start to be able to do is come up with a kind of simplified way of identifying chord roots and the particular positions that they happen to be in. So one thing that I'm going to do in just a moment is show you how useful that can be because it starts to point us in a little bit of a new direction. The possibility that chords can be connected in interesting ways. So not just the kind of root position sequence that we heard at the beginning of the Pachelbel canon, which is kind of chunky and obvious in a way. What I'm going to be interested in doing next is seeing how these can helpfully decode a musical surface to tell me what the underlying chord types are, specifically, specifically the underlying triads, and how they are related to each other. Now, before I do that, there's one other thing that I want to point out, and that is, this is kind of um, a laboratory version of harmony. How often do we actually hear little triads like this? They do come up in music. Certainly, we were hearing that in the conventional version of the, uh, the Pachelbel canon, the version that he didn't write, that accompaniment being expressed this way. So I'm playing up all of those root position triads that are in the accompaniment. But otherwise, we have pieces of music that can often have tons of notes. For example, the start of that Rachmaninoff concerto. There's no way I can understand it purely in terms of a simple triad by itself. That happens to be a minor triad, but it has many other 
notes added to it. Things that we call doublings, which also happen to be spaced quite widely apart. So in fact, even if I've come up with these simple numbers, which we refer to as figured base, because think of uh, the term figured in terms of figures, numbers in that sense, numbers that measure against whatever is given in a base, these emerge in this way from a little simple experiment that I do, but they're giving me numbers that actually refer to pitch class. I'll show you what I mean. If I consider something like this overtone series, I have something that we already know forms a C major triad, I would actually say that this was also in a 5-3 position. Why? Because these numbers refer to pitch class. Now, there's another number that I can add in there if I like the octave, and that's something that often comes to be very important when we do uh, studies of harmony, which we will not be getting into in any detail uh, in this series. But I can point out that here I could understand that as the eight. The five thing refers to that pitch class G. So there it would be. That could be our duplicate of the root once again. Here is the third part, and there is the fifth part again. So rather than trying to come up with all the sizes of diatonic interval beyond the octave that could describe all of this, the simplest thing to do is to derive these numbers from these triads in their, their simplest form, and then understand that they will refer to pitch class. So I can take something like that, I can stack it all up in one place, and it doesn't matter how far these things are away from what is given in the base, all of these things will be understandable in terms of this single figured base indication. Okay, So I don't need to double up unnecessarily on these things. All right. What that means is that whether I express this like this or like this, what we have is a C major triad in root position. Now, one other thing I can say about this is that it is a different type of spacing before everything was packed close together. So it sounded like this. And I've just come up with a version that sounds like this. So when you have all the chord elements with no gaps in between, that's what we call a close spacing. And if there are gaps in between, we call that an open spacing. So here is an open spacing of a root position C major triad. Now, of course, one of the things that I will want to do is explore this idea of the identity of the chord root, because I'm saying this is a C major triad. Okay, what other kinds of triads can there be, and how might they be related to each other? Well, the next thing that we want to consider is the idea of chords and keys. Because when I listen to something like the Pachelbel Canon, one thing is becoming very clear, and that is Pachelbel isn't just using chords at random. He's deriving all of the elements of that harmonization from the key he happens to be working in. This isn't always the case. Remember that when I was playing the uh, Arpeggione Sonata introduction the, to the second movement, this is back at the beginning of episode seven, I had given 
a harmonization of that melody that was purely diatonic. That's the kind of thing that Pachelbel does, and of course, Schubert liked to mix things up. So what we're going to be doing is just looking at the idea of diatonic harmony itself, because this is a very powerful tool. If I come to understand how triads in particular can be derived from a particular key context, that means that I will have the capacity to often take quite complex scores and transpose them rapidly. So for example, if I listen to that Paco Bell canon, the original version was in D major. Now, there's nothing that would stop me from giving it to you in C major. Or something like B flat major. understand some basic patterns at work in the context of the key, in the context of diatonic harmony, I suddenly have the power to transpose instantaneously, often quite involved in complex musical structures. So that's a very useful skill to have, a further level of transposition that we can add to what we learned about in episode 10. So the next thing that I want to do in particular is look at that idea of triads in the context of a key, and then after that we'll get back to the possible uses of figured bass. What I've done is write two scales on the board, a D major scale and a C major scale. I'm not using key signature because it'll be a little bit easier for us to see the specific interval qualities I'm interested in. Keep in mind that we are working in this context with triads, so there's a way in which I can develop a whole series of triads in the context of a key by taking each scale degree in turn as a chord root and then just stacking thirds on top of it. So for example, if I consider D major, the key that I was working in uh, when I first played the Pachelbel canon, if I stack up thirds, working only with diatonic elements, this is what I come up with, and I will play that for you. Okay, not necessarily easy to compare the sound qualities of these tries when I play them one after the other like that, but I will draw out particular points of comparison in a moment. So just to keep in mind once again that I'm working with, in each case, a new triad root which comes from the underlying scale degree. And I can do the same thing for C major. This, of course, is a little easier because I don't have to draw in any accidentals whatsoever. And again, I'm just working with the scale degrees, each taken in turn as the root of the triad. And when I stack up the thirds on top of that, I'm only working with diatonic elements. So you can see throughout here, I'm just working with F sharp, C sharp, and everything else unaltered. And here, of course, no alterations are necessary, and I can play the C major triads too. But what I'd like to do now is start to listen a little more closely to the triad qualities that I'm working with. And what's interesting, of course, is that those will be preserved 
relative to the tonic that I'm working with. So whatever information I get for this will be true for this and vice versa. So the first thing I might notice is that if I looked at the triads built on scale degrees one, four, and five, so taking scale degrees one, four, and five as chord roots, I have a D major triad, a G major triad, and an A major triad. Those are all major in quality. Same thing, of course, would be true down here, which you can see, choose any one of these. I've got a major third, a minor third, a perfect fifth. That's gonna be true for all of these things. That's C major, F major, and G major, and here's D major, G major, A major, okay? What happens if I look at things like scale degrees two, three, and six as chord roots? Well, what I get there are minor quality triads. I'll play those for you. First, the series from the D major context, I've got an E minor triad, an F sharp minor triad, and a B minor triad. And when I look at the C major context, built on scale degree two, I have the D minor triad, scale degree three, E minor triad, scale degree six, A minor triad. So right away, I notice that even though up to this point in time, I've been dealing with six possible triads in each context, um, I've only come across two chord qualities. So they sort of divided themselves neatly into opposing camps, three that are major in quality, three that are minor in quality. The leftover one, of course, is built on scale degree seven, and that is diminished. So you'll notice that in this purely diatonic context, one triad type that we haven't achieved is the augmented triad. You do need chromaticism being introduced to get that. But I'll just note once again that complete the picture since we're back to building things up on scale degree one. This is the same quality as that. So the diminished triads sound like this in the context of D major. Built on scale degree seven, I get this sound. It's a C sharp diminished triad. And in the context of C major, I get a B diminished triad. All right. Now, what will be of further interest to us is how this might connect with the Pachelbel canon. And to simplify things a bit further, what I want to do is take all of this information and convey it with a new series of numbers. We use Roman numerals. And for this course, we distinguish between uppercase and lowercase Roman numerals. Why? Because one thing that really matters is the sound quality of the triads that we are working with. To my ear, it matters whether it's major or minor or diminished or augmented, because if I want to be able to apply this to actual musical context, to be able to recognize harmonies by ear, one of the cues that my ear listens for is the quality of the triad itself. For example, if I hear a couple of triads, my ear might notice that both of those sound major in quality, so right away I would know that it couldn't be one of these ones. It narrows down what my ear has to consider. Likewise, if I hear something like this, Those are minor in quality. Well, I know it can't be any of these ones, all right? So by working with Roman numerals that distinguish between uppercase and lowercase, we're gonna be reminding ourselves of the chord quality that's associated with them. So specifically, what I do is say, right, the information that I have here is the following. If I have a triad built on scale degree one here, it will be major in quality. So if scale degree one is the chord root, it will be major in quality. I can convey all of that information by writing this. Same would be true down here. So the Roman numeral one, uppercase means built on scale degree one, taking scale degree one as the chord root, the 
uppercase means it's major in quality. So of course, right away, I know that the triad is built on scale degrees four and five in the context of a major mode will be major in quality. So of course, one, four, and five, if you will, are major in quality. That means that these other possibilities are going to be conveyed with lowercase Roman numerals. This means that if scale degree three is the chord root in the context of a major mode, the triad that results will be minor in quality. It's a lot of information from just that one little indication. That's true regardless of whether I'm in D major or C major or D flat major, that information will always be the same. And likewise, the triad built on scale degree six in this context will be minor in quality. For diminished, what we do is apply what looks like a little degree sign. That means diminished. So lowercase to reflect the fact that the diminished triad is close to a minor triad because of the minor third that it starts out with between the root and the third, but because of the diminished fifth, that's what that information conveys. And of course, to end everything, I have that. So now what I can do is listen to something like the Pachelbel Canon and describe it in these terms. And that's why I can transpose it so quickly and easily. If I listen to the chord sequence as a series of chord pairs, I hear major, minor, major. And as I start to listen, a little more carefully, for example, to a bass line. If I get a little bit better both at recognizing melodic intervals that are described by the bass line, but also the chord qualities that come out of them, I can bring these pieces of information together and notice that the whole Pachenbel canon falls on top of a repeated chord sequence that goes as follows. There it is. That is the chord structure of the entire Pachelbel canon that's announced right at the beginning. So that's why, whether I play it in D major or in C major, the analysis remains the same. Because the analysis remains the same, this is what makes it possible for me to transpose all of this stuff instantaneously. In that sense, the relationships are identical. Of course, I have to get to know my instrument well enough to be able to be able to figure out how to finger these things on the fly, but the basic idea is there. It radically simplifies my job for me. So this seems to be a very powerful tool to work with, and in fact, uh, there's a cool YouTube video by a uh, comedian musician named Rob Paravonian. Uh, just look up Pachelbel Rant, R-A-N-T, and one thing that he does is basically use this sequence as the basis for a wonderful kind of joke where he's showing how much modern music, pop music, uh, is derived from this chord sequence in the Pachelbel canon. And so I think uh, one of my favorite lines is, punk rock's just a joke, it's really just Baroque, or something like that. What he's interested in is the fact that so many modern day bands have taken up this chord sequence and just kind of set new uh, text to it, sometimes new melodic ideas, although not always. Think of uh, Vitamin C, Graduation Song, or uh, Go West by the Village People. All of these groups are working with that underlying chord sequence. So that's useful, however, there are two things that we haven't considered yet. How might that connect with the figured bass information that I uh, introduced us to before? How would this fit with the figured bass information that I introduced us to in the previous segment? 
And likewise, are we just limited to triads? Can we extend these in any fashion? So that's going to be the next couple of topics that I take up. When I started episode 11, I was using the Pachelbel canon to draw a distinction between the study of counterpoint and the study of harmony. The harmonic aspect was, of course, this accompaniment, and the contrapuntal aspect, I focused on the melodic lines. Now, one of the things we have to come to recognize is that clearly, based on a piece like this, these aspects fit together in some way. There is harmony in counterpoint, there is counterpoint in harmony. And one of the things, therefore, that we need to pay attention to is what we call voice leading in modern theory. That is, how parts of chords connect with each other. And that was one of the reasons why I started this episode with that chord sequence that begins the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto, these chords. Now, it can be hard to hear this based on how Rachmaninoff writes things because he has this sort of idea of big bells uh, sounding, which you get the sense of that from the, the swinging of a, a clapper in uh, a bell. The bell runs into the clapper and it makes the sound. And Rachmaninoff is almost physically imitating that in this fashion. So with these big leaps that are taking place, you can lose sight of this linear connection that Rachmaninoff has woven in between these sonorities up here. of semitone steps that are linking these chords in the middle of the texture. So that idea of creating links between chords in a melodic fashion below what might be a more obvious melody on top is the thing I want to turn to next. As a somewhat different example, I'm going to move to a Mozart piano sonata that's quite popular. a melody with an accompaniment underneath. I suppose I could make it sound a little bit more like Pachelbel. Now, what that is emphasizing is a sort of disjointed aspect of the accompaniment that we call an Alberti bass. So rather than just playing triads solid, I'm alternating between elements of the triad. In this case, uh, between the root, the fifth, the third, and the fifth going to shift when I go to uh, other triads. This is a four chord. It happens to be in second inverted, and I'll show you that in a moment. There I'm alternating between the fifth of the chord, the third, the root, the third. But you get the idea. I could come up, therefore, with a simplified version of this, which would be simply the following. start to point out is that below the surface of the Alberti bass, which is hopping around by consonant skips, I have a lot of smooth melodic motion taking place. And that is something that the figured bass can capture for us. And so what I want to start looking at right now is the way in which you can combine figured bass with Roman numeral analysis to both show what the underlying fundamental chord sequence is, but also how a composer binds it together in a linear fashion, contrapuntally, to make the music sound interesting. So even if I have a melody that's hopping around up there, there are a lot of wide intervals in that melody. Actually, the accompaniment counterbalances that by moving below the surface in a very smooth stepwise fashion. So let's go back to the board and take a closer look at that. So behind me is that Mozart sonata theme with the simplified accompaniment that I was playing. So rather than the Alberti bass, I've just given the solid chords. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is that 
hidden beneath the surface of the Alberti base, which is very disjointed. In fact, is quite incredible smooth motion. I'm using wiggly lines to indicate where the pitches aren't moving at all. They're staying in one place. And then straight lines to indicate motion by step. So there is a way in which I can detail a kind of melodic contour for each of the supporting harmonic parts. And by the way, in the, uh, on the course website, I've actually written this out in three different states so that you can follow all of that information there. It's, I've even uh, made it examples so that you can hear what's in the bass against the, the topmost part and then hear what's in the bass against the inside parts. You can get a complete sense of the implied counterpoint that is there. Now, if I look at this as a whole, of course, what I'm noticing is the idea of triads, in some sense, this will be a bit of an exception, supporting a overt melodic line up there, okay? So this is one way in which I can notate this type of harmonization of a melody. We're gonna be looking at another one in the final segment for this episode. But what I can now do is look at these chord types and compare them to what I would expect from the key of C major. So here is tonic harmony built on scale degree two, built on scale degree three, scale degree four, scale degree five, scale degree six, scale degree seven, and back to the tonic again. And by the way, I can come up with names like tonic for the rest of these scale degrees, and I'll give those to you in the next segment. All right, with that information, I can look at a lot of these chords and understand them right away because I can match things that are clearly in root position with what I already see here. I'm gonna leave that aside for just a moment. When I look at something like that, Visually, right away, I can see the 6-4 position. That tells me it's second inversion, and what's in the base of that is the fifth. So where I have a triad that has a fifth, that appears to be chord four. Is that the case, F-A-C? F-A-C, yes, that's the case. And even the melodic pitch there is a chord tone. So this is chord four. And then over here, I see a six, three, I should keep track of the six, four. I see a six, three position. That means first inversion. That means that the third is in the base. So where do I have a third uh, that happens to be a B in this whole segment? It's right there, chord five. So this would appear to be chord five in first inversion. Is it G, B, D? G, B, D, yes it is, and the melodic line is likewise offering a chord tone. So I can start to then recognize both the fundamental underlying chord sequence, oh, I forgot to write in this one, as well as the particular positions that those chords are in, either root position, first inversion, or second inversion, and it really matters because, again, what Mozart is doing is not just plunking chords one after the other. I mean, if it was done more sort of Pachelbel style where every chord was in root position, it would sound something like this. Which isn't at all what Mozart wrote, and I think we can start to appreciate why it matters to use a combination of chords in root position and in inversions. So that's something that makes it possible to have really a whole series of melodies coming together to form harmonies. And that's why the use of figured bass can help us to see how we can weave together our understanding of harmony and counterpoint. So if you were to take a course from me like Music 104, which is the follow-up to Music 103, this is the kind of thing that we would be doing, not just understanding harmony in the sort of vertical sense, 
but likewise how we move from one harmony to the next, which is often determined by what we call voice leading concerns and considerations. Now, there is one other thing that I want to draw our attention to here, and that is, this is a very odd looking sonority. If I were to count that thing up, I see a four and a three, and that is a kind of figured bass that we have not come across just yet. However, if I were to look at all of this together, I see something that's quite new. Up to this point in time, I've been looking at harmony solely in terms of triads, and of course triads understood as being stacked up thirds when they're in root position. What I have here, though, is a tetrad. I have a G, a B, a D, and an F. Now, the only way I could get something like that from this diatonic collection is if I were to extend this harmony that's built on scale degree five by another third. That is what we call a seventh chord. And seventh chords are extremely popular. In fact, the Rachmaninoff chords, most that you hear, not the very opening one, but everything that goes on in between happens to be of this type, where you see chords that have a root, a third, a fifth, and a seventh. So the Rachmaninoff seventh chords were those. So we started out with an F minor triad, then we had this other seventh chord, another seventh, another seventh, and then we go climb back down again. All right? Now, this is really getting into much more complex aspects of harmony that involve chromaticism, linear harmonic relationships. We don't want to get into that much detail, but I just wanted us to understand that we don't have to stop our understanding of harmony with triads. You can add on to these things relatively easily, and that's what I am seeing here. This is an odd number for us in the figured bass because that is something that represents an inversion of a seventh chord. Now, for this course, I would never expect you to recognize inversions of seventh chords, just inversions of triads, either root position or first or second inversions. But if you go into seventh chords, that can happen just so that you know that there is such a possibility. The one thing I would ask you to know is this, that you can have a chord in root position that is a seventh chord, and that's just one more piece of information that you can add to that, therefore that you can have four possible pitch classes. So on an exam, if I gave you a harmonic analysis to do, most of the time you would just be looking for three pitch classes, and I'll be showing you this in the, the final example that I give. However, if you ran across four pitch classes, and you go right away, oh, okay, for the purposes of this course, that must be one of these things. It's called a dominant seventh because aside from being able to call that the tonic, I can call that the dominant rather than the chord built on scale degree five. And if I have a dominant harmony with a seventh, I'll call that a dominant seventh. There's a particular sonority that's associated with that where you have a major triad and a minor seventh on top. So it's also known as a major minor seventh chord. Of all the Rachmaninoff seventh chords we have over here, only this one has that character of the major triad with the minor seventh. So that's one possible type, okay? So now that we have this information in place, what I want us to look at next is how you can take this kind of distribution and change it around so that it's a little bit more easy to read the linear connections between the chords. So what we're going to turn to next is something that we call vocal scoring, and it will be a helpful way to summarize all of the information that we have taken in so far.
Before we come to the last part of this episode, there are a couple more pieces of information I'd like to review. First of all, as we remember, there are many different modes available to any given diatonic collection, and that means that you can have many different possibilities for harmonic progressions. So what I've done, again, just to keep things simple, is to write out a couple of scales, a C major scale, and the scale for its relative minor, A minor. I've just kind of hopped down so that the chords that I build on top of that fit neatly on the staff. And what we will see is what we would expect to see given the fact that these are working with the same diatonic collection. Specifically, when I look at the chords available in C major, as we already know, we have major quality chords available at the uh, first scale degree or tonic, fourth and fifth, and we have minor chord qualities available at the second, third, and sixth scale degrees, and a diminished at the seventh. And we're back to one again. Now, however, if I were to reorganize things so that I was saying I want to have the same diatonic collection but choose A as my tonic, that would frame the chord collection in a different way. That would mean saying that this is now going to be chord one, that would be chord three, etc. So that's what I've drawn out here. And of course, what you'll see is that the same chord types match up with the same qualities. What changes is the Roman numeral because now this is being considered scale degree one or the tonic as the root of a tonic triad rather than scale degree six over here. So for a minor sequence of chords, we have a tonic that's going to be minor in quality. Built on the second scale degree, it will be diminished in quality, just as it was over here. The third scale degree will be producing a major chord. The uh, fourth scale degree will be producing a minor chord. The fifth will also be producing a minor chord unless I alter it. I'll talk about that in a moment. Sixth scale degree will be producing a major quality chord. Seventh scale degree, again, not chromatically altered, would be producing a major quality chord. Now, having pointed that out, the next thing I want us to see is how often we have opposite chord quality. So the chord that's going to be at the center of a piece that's in A minor is going to be a minor triad. And one of the things we want to keep in mind is that uh, work like the Paco Bell Canon with that chord sequence that it has at the start, it's functioning rather like melodies that we were introduced to earlier in the course where a melody began and ended with the same pitch. It was easy for us to hear that as the tonic of the melody is framing all other melodic activity. Similarly, when we have chord progressions that behave in that way, it's easy to hear that framing chord as the point of reference for all the other ones, to hear it as not just a chord or triad built on a tonic scale degree, but as a tonic triad itself. So that progression, keeps circling back to the tonic triad. So it would be difficult for me to hear any other chord functions assigned to the other chord types. My ear keeps hearing the same sequence of triads that begins and ends with a D major triad. That is gonna make that D major triad sound like tonic harmony. Now, if I compare these side by side though, as I already mentioned, I've got a sort of opposite quality for the tonic. So that's gonna have a major impact. If the triad of reference is minor in quality, that's going to cast an effect over the harmonic progressions used in that key as a whole. Likewise, if the tonic harmony is major, that is going to create a frame of reference in which I hear everything else. And that, I notice other things like that uh, chords three and six are opposite in quality. So if I'm in a major key, then chord three and chord six are minor in quality. It's the opposite when I'm in a minor context. So one of the uh, pieces that I was playing uh, much earlier, back in episode four, was this Funeral March by Chopin. I 
was alternating between something that was a minor chord quality and a major chord quality. So I was going back and forth between this one and that three. That's something that's very characteristic of a minor key, or likewise with chord six. It's the opposite if I'm in a major key. When I move to chords three or six, it will sound like a bit of a shadow has come over the harmonic language, and I'm moving into something that has a minor quality. And then again, we have opposites with chords four and five. So there's a way in which harmony tends to emphasize a kind of polarity between major and minor keys. Now, we have to keep in mind that you can, of course, develop harmonic systems that work with the other mode types. And so, for example, this is nothing new. Beethoven, in his A minor string quartet, opus 132, has a slow movement that he describes as being in a Lydian key. It's often mistranslated in English as uh, being in the Lydian mode. But uh, Beethoven actually uses the, the term Tonacht in German. It means key. So Beethoven understood all of his harmonization, not in terms of major or minor in that particular piece, but in terms of a Lydian framework. So do keep that in mind. If Beethoven thinks that you can have uh, harmonic progressions in a Lydian key, uh, that's good enough for me. Now, if I come back to this particular comparison, of course, what I'm doing here is retaining nothing but the diatonic collection for A minor. That is to say, what's represented by a key signature, because a key signature only uses accidentals that are diatonic to the key. So this is A diatonic minor, A natural minor. But we also learned in episode seven about models of chromaticism that can be employed in the minor key. And one of the ones that we learned about was the harmonic minor scale. So the impact of that can be quite considerable. That's where you can get things like, finally, an augmented triad. And by the way, the way in which we indicate augmentation for a triad, remember we use this little symbol, this little almost degree sign to indicate diminished. For an augmented triad, we actually give it a little plus sign. All right, so if I'm using chord three in a minor context, often that will be augmented. Likewise, this particular harmony built on scale degree five will also often have that type of alteration. Similarly, the root of scale degree seven is raised into a leading tone, and that would then give us parity with the uh, original use of a scale degree seven triad in the major. We have a seven diminished triad. This is important. Uh, the change to the fifth scale degree, or the triad that's built on the fifth scale degree, does not have to happen. Sometimes that is the impression people will get when they begin to learn harmony because using harmonic minor scale, that's often what you do. But you're not obliged to do that kind of thing. And in fact, great composers like uh, Sergei Rachmaninoff, for example, who I started this episode with, love to use a diatonic fifth chord. Now, I have used this term dominant every once in a while. I even snuck it into uh, a Bach melody that we were listening to in, uh, at the start of episode five. You might remember when I was talking about uh, stepwise motion being used to form a kind of link or chain between two statements of a note B in this melody. I was talking about how that B seemed to 
be a rather dominant one in the, uh, the context of the melodic contour. Uh, that can be part of the idea that a dominant note like that is something that can kind of create a sense of opposition to what you get from the tonic. And a lot of tonal music takes place in a kind of dynamic tension between tonic and dominant. Well, this is part of a naming system that you will run across. You're not required to know it for this course, but it can be helpful to know, especially I, important, I think, for me to explain it because uh, when I was first introduced to it, I didn't understand the logic behind it. And so I'm not always sure that that's being taught. So what I'll do is erase this information for the time being, I'm just going to want to keep that. I should point out that I'm showing you the relationship between major and minor in terms of setting up a framework for harmonies uh, out of interest, and I think it's something that comes logically from the discussion we've had about relative mode types, relative keys earlier on in the course. However, when it comes to an exam, I'm not going to expect you to be able to analyze harmonies in a minor mode. The main thing I'd like you to be able to take away from this course is simply the capacity to correctly apply Roman numerals in just one mode. And I think if you can get comfortable with that, then that sets you up to start to explore other mode types and you will know what to do. So we'll, we'll just be focusing on the major from here on. But that terminology, tonic, dominant, where is it coming from? I've already talked about this idea of a kind of polarity between tonic and dominant that they establish either points in a melody or points in harmony that can kind of vie with one another and create a kind of structural tension in music. So dominant up here. And if I think of it in terms of harmony, I'll just notate things in terms of a major mode. That would be this triad built on scale degree five. So I can refer to that as dominant harmony. Well, there's something known as the subdominant too, which is very important. And when I was initially taught about these kinds of things, as a very young student, I was told that, well, here it is. That's the subdominant because it's just below the dominant. But actually, that's not true. Where the term comes from is literally the idea of a dominant below. If I look at the interval relationship between C and G, that's a perfect fifth above. If I go a perfect fifth down, that is the subdominant. And that would correspond with the scale degree that we use for chord four. So this would refer to subdominant harmony. Mediating in between the tonic and the dominant is the median here, which would correspond with the triad built on scale degree three. Mediating between the tonic and the subdominant is the submedian. correspond with the triad built on scale degree six, taking scale degree six as its root. Then between the tonic and the median, we have what is just above the tonic, which we refer to as the supertonic, which of course refers to scale degree two. And between the tonic and the submediant, Some texts refer to the subtonic, super above, sub underneath. Or, of course, the leading tone. And so I can have a triad built on that. I can indicate it in that fashion. And in fact, some people will use the term subtonic to refer to 
the diatonic triad that's built on the, the diatonic seventh scale degree. So to distinguish the subtonic seventh from the leading tone seventh harmony that's a uh, leading tone triad that's built on the raised uh, seventh scale degree. Okay, So this is where this terminology comes from. You don't need to know it for this course, but it will be helpful for you to recognize it if you want to pursue further studies in harmony afterwards, because these ways of describing chords tell you instantaneously what the scale degree is and then what the triad quality would be that's built from it. Okay, So for example, I could say the Paco Bell Canon. Uh, the chord progression there goes from tonic to dominant to Submedian to mediant to subdominant tonic, subdominant dominant, and away I go. And I notated that before. All right. So there is all the information that you need to understand terms like dominant seven. So once again, what I've indicated is that you can have seventh chords, of course, built on any of these scale degrees. Uh, where you will be expected to recognize that would be with the dominant seventh, the most common type of seventh chord. One other bit of information that I'd like to give you, again, not required for the course, but that will just help give you some sense of what you can find out there in the world of music. You might recall from earlier in this course, back uh, in Lesson 7, I talked about a type of scale that was known as the diminished whole tone. Diminished cognate for octatonic, semitone whole tone, semitone whole tone. That was that bit and then the whole tone aspect all the way through there. So the diminished whole tone, octatonic whole tone scale, was one that I said you can use by itself to uh, create a framework for a melody, but I also said it was often very popular as a chromatic model for working with altered chords. So in keeping with this idea of being able to extend things Further, let's imagine that I was going to build a dominant seventh chord in the key of F major. So there would be my dominant seventh. There's nothing that stops me from continuing that further. I can have dominant ninths, I can have dominant elevenths, up to and including dominant thirteenths. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because. When I played a dominant ninth for you back in lesson seven, it sounded like this. All right, so this, I made some alterations to. All right, so here is a dominant ninth. And the changes I made were as follows. I made a chromatic alteration there and a chromatic alteration there. And so through enharmonic equivalence, you can now start to see why I favored the use of the diminished whole tone as uh, a scale that I could use to improv on top of something like an altered ninth chord like this. So this shows you Two things, first of all, that you can extend uh, all of these triads through 7th, 9th, 11th, and 13th. So the 11th and 13th, those tend to be the province of dominant harmony. Also, however, you can, of course, make chromatic alterations. So when you start to study harmony, you discover quickly that you don't just have to limit the use of chromatic alteration to what you get shown in a harmonic minor scale or a melodic minor scale. So this is why the topic of chromaticism and harmony is a huge one. But this is looking much further ahead. What I would like to do now is just consider how this kind of information can help me out with something like this. 
This is a chord progression. I'll play for you. Nothing too fancy, and you might wonder why it's written in this odd fashion. So the first thing that I want to do is try to play for you a little bit of a musical excerpt that I hope the uh, phone mic will be able to pick up on. You might remember me playing for you earlier on today this chord progression by Bartok. And I said then that what I was playing <clears throat> was from a Bartok piano concerto, <clears throat> but what I was playing was actually for the orchestra. That wasn't the piano part. I'd like you to hear just a little bit of the orchestra part for a particular reason. This is something that's actually played by strings. And so what really matters is not just the verticality of these chords. And remember, Bartok's chords are not triads in our conventional sense. They were built out of perfect fifths. So that's why it has this wonderful open sound. Well, these were written in that particular context for violins, which therefore have a very sustained effect. And you can really hear the linear connections between the different parts of the harmony. So I'll play a little bit of that for you right now. Okay, so I hope some of that was able to come through. And the reason why I wanted you to hear it is because what I'm going to show you is something that can seem a little bit like too much of an exercise. There's a very good reason for it. When I listen to music like that, I can hear how important it is for Bartok as a composer to have a sense of these harmonies shifting from one to the other in a very seamless fashion, as though what we have are six melodies stacked one on top of the other. He wants us to hear not just the overall sound quality of these beautiful chords made of stacked up perfect fifths, but also the linear relationships between them. So this is something that we also want to do when we start to study harmony in a careful way, whether we're writing it Bartok style or in this triadic style that Rameau promoted so strenuously back in the 18th century, and that is still the foundation for most harmonic practice, at least at an introductory level. So what happens? Well, you remember that I played in a previous segment this Mozart melody. And I pointed out that it really is the use of a melodic line with a supporting cast uh, a triad structure. So at a very basic level, what we're interested in is figuring out how to take a prominent melodic line, usually in the topmost part of the texture, and support it with triadic harmonies underneath. So what that means if we add everything up is that we'll have four parts to a very basic texture. Now, of course, you can double up on things and grow your harmony proportionately, but the idea here is to stick with just the basics, to become familiar with what you can do when you want to have a melody and harmonic accompaniment, but you want that harmonic accompaniment nonetheless to have the characteristics of counterpoint, that there is something that meaningfully connects all the parts of the harmony together. So this is why we write 
our basic harmonic exercises in this form. It's called vocal scoring, and vocal scoring is something that will show us the four parts, the idea being that fundamentally you have a melodic line and harmonic support underneath, although the melodic line itself, of course, can be composed of nothing but chord tones. By the way, for this course, that's what we'll always be dealing with. You can have lots of wonderful non-chord tones uh, that can get harmonized too, but that's a subject matter for a proper harmony course in itself. So we'll have everything being chord tones, but the idea is a lead melody, harmonic support. That means we're going to have four parts. And to help us see the linearity of this harmonic texture, we tend to write uh, in such a fashion that the stems of the notes go in opposite directions so that I can see very clearly one line and then another in one staff and same thing in the next staff. So it's no problem for me to see what's happening melodically in all of these parts. Now there's one other consequence of this and that is that if I have four parts in general to this kind of harmonic texture, but I'm working with triads, well, by definition then, I'm going to see, ordinarily speaking, a lot of doubling. So one of the things I'm going to want to be on the lookout for is the repetition of certain pitch classes. Now, again, for the purposes of this course, anything that I give you for an exam would have only chord tones being used. Again, my interest here is to get you comfortable with the basic tools of harmonic analysis. So I look at something like this and I will also be able to know in this course that any harmonization I'm given will be in a particular key. I'm not going to shift things around and to make things even nicer I'll start and finish all of my harmonic progressions with the same harmony, just like the Pachelbel Bell Canon harmonic progression, so that I can clearly hear what tonic harmony would be, what my point of reference would be. So of course, I can look at something like this and assume there's a key signature there. Uh, there are no sharps or flats there. This could be a key signature for, say in the most conventional sense, either C major or A minor. So one thing that I would want to look for is, well, what are my starting and concluding chords? And what that means is that I want to start looking at these things as collections of pitch classes, and I might want to keep track of that. I'm going to guess, because I see my melody starting on E and ending on C, and the bass line beginning and ending on C, it's giving me a sense of something that's in C major. I'm not seeing any sharps or flats. So to help myself out, one thing I would do is quickly write out the corresponding scale for the key I think this is going to be in. Write out the actual triads that would result diatonically from that. As a little clue to myself, I'll add in a seventh conveniently for a potential dominant seventh. And then see how this information matches up with what I see over there. So if I look at this closely and start to read the, the staff, I see that I've got a C, another C, a G, and an E. And if I look over here, the one triad that actually has those three pitch classes is this one, tonic harmony. I've got the C doubled up. Okay, that seems fine. One G, one E. This tells me that this is going to be tonic harmony. And what I recommend for harmonic analysis is that you do this part first. That is to say, you want to figure out what the appropriate Roman numeral is, what the origin of the chord happens to be. I come to this and I see a D, a B, a G, and another D. So I don't need to write that again. I have another triad. What is the one harmony that has D, B, and G in it? Well, it's right here. There's my D, B, G. Ah, this is dominant harmony. 
I come to the next chord, I see an E, a C, a G, and a second C. Well, that's just a reordering of this thing. Once again, this is tonic harmony. I'm just going to take it that far for the time being, because the next thing I would want to do is say, okay, well, it's nice to know that my underlying chord progression is one, five, one, tonic, dominant, tonic, but obviously things are being reordered a bit. Now, here's the thing. You do not have to get very fussy about your use of figured bass. You can remind yourself what the correct figures are for standard triads in root position, first and second inversion. If you want to do that, you don't even need a clap. Just remind yourself what these rotations would look like, right? I have a five and a three as root position, six, three as first inversion, six, four, that's second inversion. So I can remind myself of that, but even though I've written this within the confines of basically a, uh, an octave in a little bit, these numbers refer to pitch class rather than pitch. So whether I literally have a third there or I have a third all the way up here, for example, it doesn't matter exactly where it is. All that matters is that I have a complete triad and one element of that triad is in the base. That's why this is figured base, not figured root, but figured base, measuring things from the base. So what this means is if I have a complete triad, What's in the base is the root. If I have a complete triad here, and this, by the way, is what I'm reassuring myself of by doing this analysis, then if the third is in the base, I apply this figured base. If the fifth is in the base, then six, four. So that actually is the only thing I need to do to complete the analysis, because I can look at this and say, well, I've already figured out that this is tonic harmony, what is in the base? The root, the third, or the fifth? I see a C, I see a C, that is the root, therefore I use that as my figured base. I already know this is dominant harmony. What is in the base? The root, the third, or the fifth? Well, it's the D. I look at dominant harmony and I say, ah, D is the fifth, therefore if the fifth is in the base, I simply call it 6-4. That is second inversion. Back to tonic harmony, E is in the base. What component of the triad is E? That is the third. If the third is in the base, then that is how I analyze it. So it really is that easy to do harmonic analysis if you give yourself those few basic steps. Write out what you think will be the scale that covers the key that you want to analyze in terms of Help yourself out by writing out as well the diatonic triads that would emerge from that. And then the first thing you want to do is check out which particular triad it is you're working with. Go for Roman numerals first. If you have that information and you have this information, you then just need to look at the base to see which component of the triad is in the base and that automatically gives you your figured base. Now, what if some of these parameters change a little bit? Here, for example, I see a G, a D, an F, ooh, and a B. So this is not a triad, this is a tetrad. And from what I know about basic harmony, I'm going to come across a tetrad if I have a seventh of some kind. And in this course, that would be a dominant seventh. Is that the case? So I'm guessing that this would be a seventh chord, most likely a dominant seventh. I want to check this out. I have a G, a D, an F, and a B. Yes, indeed, this is a dominant seventh. And that would be enough figured base for me, although, of course, if you want, you can put that other information in as well. So that is something more than a triad. Is it possible to have something less? I come back here and I see a C, I see an E, 
and another C. I only have a C and an E. And yet, the harmony still sounds okay. Maybe not quite as full as I might like, but this really is sounding to me like a C major triad that happens to be missing its fifth. So, in that case, I don't have this component. All I have is the third, which is that pitch right there. So it's also possible for me to have a harmonic implication, in this case, of a tonic triad in root position without having all of the information given to me. So I can look for these kinds of variations where I could get something larger than a triad or possibly something somewhat less. But in every case, I'm taking the same sequence of steps. I'm kind of narrowing things down so I know what range of harmonies I might be working with. I check the notes and often when I look at final exams, by the way, I see this kind of thing being done because that's a way in which obviously students keep track of the information that they've analyzed. And they can see this, they can compare it with that. I always see this being written out. And then they get this information, the Roman numerals. And then it's so easy to just pick out from here which component is in the base to give the rest of that information. So. This is just an introduction to the idea of harmony, specifically diatonic harmony. The last segment that I'll do as a kind of send-off for the course is just show you a couple of textbooks that you might be interested in if you actually wanted to begin to study this kind of topic further. Uh, there are also, of course, lots of wonderful videos on YouTube, often done by very clever people with great musical examples. And I'm hoping that with this kind of language in place, you'll be in a position to start to teach yourself many more possibilities for harmonization.